Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea and today we're going to be talking about two new records uh, that we that have I mean I at least have been anticipating these records heavily and it seemed inevitable that we would cover them. Uh, the first is the new Casey Musgraves album Star Crossed, the long-awaited follow-up to her smash hit Grammy sweeping breakthrough Golden Hour. And the second record we're going to be discussing today is slowcore legends turned weird minimal electronic artists low with their new record, Hey, What? And that's uh, those are the, the main features today. I, of course, am not Jake. Jake is unable to join us today uh, due to family occurrences. And so we're going to plow through and uh, make the best of this current situation. Uh, we also are going to be putting out additional videos this week. Uh, we have a record club on neutral milk hotels in the aeroplane over the sea. And we have our 1991 retrospective continuing with Nirvana's Nevermind. And also it's something of a sad week as well, as this is Sersha's final week as a permanent member of the podcast. Obviously, we expect Sersha to join us here and there where she can in the future whenever she wants to but this is going to be the the end of the permanent dynasty so in many ways this uh is the, this the three videos that uh we it's, do this uh, week. It, it really is a celebration of endings hey, hey oh, you, oh hey, just <laughs> maybe like i um, i feel like i teed that up and you just absolutely knocked it out great. of the park that was great <laughs> my, my my instinct is to be angry but i'm <laughs> not sure how angry i can be <laughs> No, no, this is... Uh... I feel I feel honoured that you make such a bad pun to honour my last episode on this podcast. Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. No. Yeah. It's been a delightful time, and I'm really glad we're finishing on the... Well, the, the old albums, at least, that we're talking about then. <laughs> um, like, these things... You know what? <laughs> I, we, we, we can only blame Miss Musgraves, and we'll get into it, because... I do. Um, because... By all accounts, that album should have been something special, and instead it is what it is. So we'll get, but that's a, a topic for discussion in a short while. Uh, first of all, we'll do as we normally do uh, our What We've Been Listening To segment, where we talk about records unrelated to the ones we're reviewing that we have been spinning uh, in the last seven days. August, what have you been listening to of, of late? So... The first thing I've been listening to, a an album I've been hotly anticipating, the new Andrew WK album, uh, God is Partying. Uh, this is a this is kind of a continuation of his his recent streak of like spiritual partying albums where partying becomes not just a, a physical act, but a like a religious exercise for him, uh, an exercise of like religious significance. And this is kind of his, uh, interestingly enough, divorce album, where he's oh, talking boy. about the separation from his partner. And- uh, I had enough of those. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked this, but what you need to understand about this album and what will trip up most first listeners is the album is only nine songs long, but on most streaming services, it is listed as being 12 because there are two bonus tracks and a single edit of the opening track tacked on to this. And that, that concise nine track, 40 minute experience is a really solid pretty exciting Andrew WK album with some really notable highs but that additional tacking on of like another 10 minutes to the album's runtime of pretty mediocre material is just just a waste and you see why those tracks were left on the cutting room table because the album has this like really complete narrative arc of like acceptance and just moving on with your life and then you tack on these additional songs that really shoot that arc in the foot and then when you have the opening track again as your closer it just doesn't work 
I, I mean, Donda type beat. Uh, I think you, <laughs> I, I think any given Andrew WK record should be like, 35 minutes tops yeah like that's a good length for an andrew wk record and i think that that's why i get wet is his best because it's about 35 minutes and that's all you need it makes me think of another album about sort of growing old and still partying and working that into your life that being like imagine if jeff rosenstock's worry after like the medley at the end had two shitty bonus tracks and the re-edit of we beg to explode you know what Sersha, is that you just read my mind because I was just about to say that this is not a diss to Andrew WK. I think I Get Wet is a phenomenally fun record, but like the niche that he fills as an artist, I think that Jeff Rosenstock feels much better. Um, I don't know that the album of his that we reviewed last year, No Dream, was a little bit divisive on the podcast, but I feel like, yeah, if you go back to his records like Worry or We Cool or even his stuff with Bomb the Music Industry, you get a similar sort of like really punchy, loud, aggressive sort of pop power punk aesthetic that uh, has a lot more grit and teeth to it. But that said, Andrew WK is, it's kind of unfair to, to equip, put them on a similar pedestal. Andrew WK is, is very much this singular figure, but I have to say I've never really taken gotten a lot of that thrill out of his music in the same way but mm, I'll, I'll yeah. still check out this new one maybe i mean uh i'm it, sure it's, it's probably pretty good the the singles are definitely worth it there are other good songs on there but it is telling on only a nine track album when there is a minute a like less than minute long filler track mm. uh but ouch yeah i still enjoyed it but it has noticed very notable problems for me. Yeah. The other thing I listened to this week was Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell. Uh, this, it, this is about, I don't know, it's, it's about as cheesy, goofy, and over the top you can make a record. And it's just so fun. It's so fun and so catchy. Isn't it though? Like, yeah. Meat Life is the only dude who can just do this blown out version of like this absolutely ridiculous style of rock and roll, make the songs like 10 minutes long at their yeah. longest and just have you enamored for all of it. And I think a, a big part of it is due to Jim Steinman, the songwriter. Jim Steinman, absolutely. Who is sort of, the Meatloaf is kind of like the performer, but Jim Steinman is the songwriter yeah. and uh, his work on Bad Out of Hell and the sequel album, which I think deserves uh, a shout out as well, which has, which has the, that huge, song of his uh, i would do anything for love but i wouldn't do that on it um anyway both those records but especially the first one i uh, just like i used to kind of have this elitist attitude of like our oh, meatloaf is boomer music and it's just like it's all cheesy and dumb but i just over the recent few years i've learned to kind of overcome that stance and just embrace the those records for the absolute joys that they are uh and and yeah, I mean the jokes and stuff are a little bit crude and corny. And Admittedly, stuff, but... it is cheesy and dumb, but that's why it's fun. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, yeah, yeah. like I like I I admit that it, that the, the jokes are crude and the attitudes are like very kind of like you know very boomery and stuff. But that's still not going to stop me from absolutely wailing along to Paradise by the ba Dashboard <laughs> Light, which is again one of the funniest songs. No, of the and, and that's also one of like the most boomer humor songs where it's like I hate my wife, but it's also <laughs> funny as hell. It's yeah, it's like you have like I hate my wife in a like really kind of grating way in some artists but this is like Rodney Dangerfield take my wife please type of yeah. I hate my wife which is uh, so much more appealing to me yeah sometimes uh, the boomer shit goes mm. yeah realizing how to interact with Beatloaf came seeing like his acting performances in like films like Rocky Horror and uh, Fight Club and stuff and just seeing how not seriously he takes himself uh, that was a oh. real gateway into that Oh, August, have you seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show? That strikes me as a I, very you movie. I have not. Okay, you'll uh, really enjoy that. He has a performance in that movie as like the the demon spawn of this of the main character that is <laughs> like he like rides on a motorcycle down a staircase and it's just absolutely amazing. Sweet. No. Uh and one other note I want to do about this album before being done with my part of this segment is 
and I the song that I think is like just one of the weirdest enigmas in this album particularly is two out of three ain't bad which is like this sentimental ballad just after these like just super like after and directly before these super like charged up songs where he's like I want to fuck and I want to fuck on a truck and then he's like <laughs> and he's like baby our life sucks let's get a divorce <laughs> meatloaf is the king between that song and I would do anything for love meatloaf is the king of like backhanded compliments like of saying something like that you're the most you the I love this woman so much but yet she makes me want to fucking kill myself yeah or you know <laughs> just put a finger in my ass or something <laughs> yeah I love you. I need you. <laughs> I think you'll be out without laughing. No, it's but yeah, it's a very entertaining album. And that's all I have. Okay. okay I, I did, as a matter of fact, listen to things this week. I know. Wild. But is it noting that it was it's uh is, is it Yankee Hotel Foxtrot's 20th anniversary? That's correct. Yeah, noting that it was that, I decided to finally fucking sit down and listen to that thing. And I, I liked it a good deal. There are definitely flavors in there that I'm like, I see myself connecting more with the parts of this band that probably focus on this sound a little more than this sound that comes after it, uh, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not hard at all to see why it's a classic. I, ha- I definitely haven't really heard anything like it. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. I think yeah. Shit. The, song, the song Jesus, etc. is one of my favorite songs of yeah. all time. That song is just utterly, just beautifully yeah. well-written and heartbreaking. Yeah, that was, that's, that was a definite highlight. Um, and like, isn't the ashes of the American flag after that? Yeah, that, that's right. That is a hell. That is a hell of a one-two punch. So yeah, enjoyed that very much. I also took a listen to the uh, the first Injury Reserve album in preparation for next week. That shit, fucking get the fuck up. It's yes. <laughs> yeah, it loses me a little in the back half, um, of where the energy kind of dies down. Uh, but that just might be some first listen growing pains where just the energy switches up and i didn't exactly anticipate it but yeah like like that a lot as well i i would also i think that that album is, has great highs in it but it's a little inconsistent which i think is probably in keeping with what some of what you're saying but um right. yeah. my recommendation <clears throat> my recommendation if you enjoy that is actually to check out the mixtape floss which i think mm. is, is much better than the self-titled album and is like more or less front to back bangers. There's a couple of sadder songs on it, but it's much more focused on just that kind of like really crowd pleasing energy that you get mm. in songs like Get the Fuck Up and um, Jailbreak the Tesla and stuff. It's just more focused on, on floss. Um, but yeah, none of those records can really prepare you for the new one anyway, but they're, yeah. worth, they're worth checking out because if you were to just listen to the new one, you'd have no idea the other things that they're capable of. And that's what I like about them so much is that they don't really do the same sort of thing on each project they've made. They've always done something different. Um, but yeah, Floss, 100% is their best yeah. prior to we'll, this new one anyway. We'll add to library. Uh, the last thing I'll mention was a, a re-listen. The Big Red Machine performance of one of the songs off of their most recent album uh they played on colbert and that ended up on my recommended and i watched that and you know in, instead of going and listening to that album i just went back and listened to uh, forever forever ago because it had been eons and i yeah yeah every bit of that one holds up that shit hurted oh yeah that's a great great album one of the one of the pretty instrumental uh, works that 
got me into folk and more minimalist esque stuff. Yeah, like so the it, thing, was, it was great to revisit it. The thing about it is like it's a very simple template musically. Um, and a lot of it gets talked about in terms of the conceptual framework of it, of Justin Vernon has that awful breakup and goes into this cabin in the woods and writes these songs. But if you strip all of that away, the songs are just remarkably well written. Like it's a very classic yes. feeling album, even though it's made up of, the, of these very kind of simple parts. It's just the songs are just consistently feel very classic. Like um, the title track, for instance, is one of my favorite Bon Iver songs. It's just beautifully moving and yet yet every person i've ever talked to about that record has a different sort of favorite track on it i don't even know what mine is but it's just really great from front to back and i don't think that anything this is not to denigrate the other stuff that justin's done but i don't think anything he's done after it has remotely touched it in terms of that potency and i think that's kind of part of his point because he's kind of willfully moved into this more obscure place not just in, in terms of like making electronic music but he writes much more cryptically and strangely now. Whereas if you go back to Forema, it's just those very plaintive, perfectly distilled thing that uh, is heartbreaking. Yeah. Sersha, what have you been listening to? I've been on like a really big uh, jazz kick in the last week. And I want to highlight one album in particular from all of this, which was spurred on by our Tim Buckley discussion. That being um, Prepare Thyself to Deal with a Miracle by uh, Rassan Rodenkirk, uh, which is this third stream spiritual jazz thing. Um, it ends with a 20 minute track that's broken up into three sort of distinct sections. It all feels very homogenous, but there isn't a second of the whole thing that doesn't just absolutely bang. Um, I really want to recommend it. Um, I. I didn't, I didn't know if I expected it to live up to the title, but uh, boy, did it. I, I felt like this is one of the most like exciting jazz records I've heard for a long, long time. Um, and I want to recommend that. Um, I, do, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, a band I've talked about on the podcast before, that being Crywank, uh, have kind of sort of come out with a new record. They released a breakup record last year that I really liked. And the founding member is released an album under the Crywank name. It's much, it's much more back in the folk direction with a rock influence. Um, it's really good. And it ends with a parody of an album we have trashed on this podcast. And they're going to read you out the title. Commodified Descent as an Act of Resistance, open bracket, or the many disappointments of the fictional band of hypocrites known as Ultra Bono. <coughs> <laughs> Ultra Bono. That, that sends shivers oh. down my spine. Oh no. <laughs> That's a great title. Let me Yeah, oh, let me um read you some of the lines. We'll Please. be a socialist band who treat thank yous to Amazon. Another one is uh write uh, mm, sense myself in movements when they seem usable. Write songs where you all scream black is beautiful because as a white man, I feel it's my duty. I figure they're all waiting for me to reaffirm their beauty. Which is a pretty hard diss. Oh, that's, yeah. hilarious. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> and a bag of Michael Keaton. <laughs> May they rest in peace. Yeah, really. Um, and I did um, a, a little thing because it's my last uh, episode as a main cast member I guess um, which is I wanted to do a thing where I listened to one album that would be um, a band that I've been putting off that is like an album loved by each member of the podcast. So I started uh, on Tyler with Azure by Steely Dan, um, which I, it, it's beautiful <laughs> to me, Sersha, and I wouldn't have it any other way that you completely butchered the pronunciation of that three letter <laughs> word. <laughs> go, go off. That's. <laughs> No, I, um, I I don't really know what I expected, but um, it was just one of the smoothest fucking things I've heard in my entire life. Uh, it, I was like putting out my washing, like, go off, King. This is beautiful. They, they, they do have like, I should say, because a lot of people kind of make a misconception. They have a lot of grittier 
music and i mean that in terms of like music with harder edges musically um but like asia mm -hmm. is just this beautifully polished thing and the reason it works is because the songwriting is so astounding the, yeah, the whole way through absolutely. like it's not just a record that coasts on a good vibe it's a record that you know breaks your heart a little bit as well but they yeah. do have um if you want to hear some of that music and that style that has a little bit of a grittier noisier edge to it i recommend the royal scam which is the album that came right before it and has one of their biggest songs kid charlemagne on it that record will blow your ass out yeah <laughs> but no i'm like I'm, i've always been a big fan growing up of uh you know musicians like otis redding and that era of music and i'm a big motown fan as well yeah. um so the musical stylings of this album really appealed to me in the way that they were channeling those influences and not just like making a pastiche but just doing a really good iteration of that sound yeah well that's the cool thing about steely dan is they started off as a rock and roll band they were influenced by jazz music and their structure and they eventually became a jazz band that was influenced by rock and roll in their structure and asia is the point at which they fully lean right into the smooth jazz side of things and down to the well, not even just smooth jazz but like down to the fact that on the title track you have wayne shorter of miles davis fame giving one of his most incandescent solos of his, his entire life while you know so you have a great fusion of like proper good fucking dope jazz shit in that record and like just enough kind of beautifully contorted guitar solos at the heart of a lot of these songs that give it just enough kind of verve and edge and it's just like it's just seasoned to perfection yeah the the title track was um a big standout for me um I peg as well loved that song um timeless but yeah uh the i the in the same day i moved on to the morgan record which was uh, a farewell to kings a farewell to kings by rush uh which i oh man it's so good it's much more fun mm. than i expected it to be um mm. I, like it's of course a very ambitious record but it there's a lot of moments on it that uh bang this is like how great I accessible moment yes great accessible moments i i took a gander through august's tens on write your music all and three decided of them to go for the inner mounting flame by the ma the mahavishnu orchestra <laughs> never has there ever been a record more tailored for you sir sure i don't think like and the specific things that you love about jazz music that that it, it stuns me you hadn't heard it yet yeah no. <laughs> it was it's one of those stuff. albums i heard like all of you recommending was like i'll get around to it but you're right it has everything i like about jazz in it just te technical brilliance textural um very interesting textures um and you can never really tell where it's going like there's a ballad right in the middle of it that i would never have seen coming um and that's one of the highlights well the jake record uh that he isn't here for unfortunately but it was endless light by O brother which i talked a little bit about in the chat um jake has banged on about O brother correctly because i i loved this record apparently O brother had been sort of like a sludge metal band in the past this is sort of like it reminded me a lot of koina yokan actually like very fuzzy rock if that makes sense. Um, and, and like, I've had a lot more time to probably fall in love with Corny Yokan, but I fully intend to do the same with this album. It's got such a wonderful blend of genre influences. It's very vibey, moody, very arty. Uh, it's very like aggressive in its moodiness. Uh, I got a lot out of it. I've uh, only listened to the first O oh Brother album, which I enjoyed very much. I've been meaning to get to Endless Light as well. So that's probably a good kick up the boot to do that ASAP. Uh, in terms of what I've been listening to, I have a few things I want to shout out. First of all, I want to shout out uh, a record, a new record that we haven't had the chance to review, which is the new Sleigh Bells album, Texas, uh, with an I, because reasons. Uh, this is, I mean, if you enjoy Sleigh Bells, you'll enjoy this record. It moves further away from their pure noise chaos roots into more refined um slashings of like really aggressive rock with these kind of like very hard hitting synths as a bedrock uh so yeah if you enjoy any of the more recent work like i do their 2016 album jessica rabbit is still one of my favorite records of that entire year then this record won't disappoint it is very hard hitting i think it's the most concise and punchy 
uh, Slay Bow's record structurally since their early days as well. It's just 10 songs and they just whip from front to back. Um, Morgan, I know you really liked that one teaser track that they put out. You'll like the whole mm. album. The whole album is just like that. Uh, it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's nothing that's going to reinvent the wheel like Slay Bow's have in the past, but uh, it's still really fun slab of really adrenaline pumping uh, rock music. This is the kind of record that um i think death from above and royal blood and that kind of pe those kinds of people think that they're making in the year 2021 but they don't have the actual refinement of the production that sleigh bells have and they don't have the sheer charisma of alexis Karas as a lead vocalist uh so yeah really enjoyed that uh i want to shout out as well a bit of a redemption moment because um oh. the one of the earliest albums that we reviewed uh, was, and, and the first, I think, time, and, and one of only two times to date that we've reviewed a New Zealand artist was when we reviewed the Beth's sophomore record, Jump Rope Gazers, last year, which I came back to and still have much of the same feeling about. I think that there's a great set of songs in the first half of that record, and then less the second half of it as a bit of a drop-off, unfortunately. But on a strong recommendation from a Twitter mutual, I... And, and on a desire to be like a well-heard and representative Kiwi, I went back and listened to their first album, Future Me Hates Me, which is like so much better than Jump Rope Gazes. It's not even funny how much better it is, frankly. <laughs> a big part of this difference is that they had a different drummer on their first album who left the band after that record. And he is the fucking glue. That and it's not to say the songs aren't great. The songs are excellent. They've got really great chiming melodies, really strong chord structures, really good vocal performances but the rhythm section on this first album is absolutely great i compared it to early block party in terms of how integral that rhythm section is to the punchiness of the songs and i stand by that's, it i listened that's loaded no I, I know it's loaded i know but i i, I say that with my whole pussy it is the, the <laughs> rhythm section on that first beth's album is fucking tight and the, it's not just that it's a tight rhythm section, but the drummer is really creative as well. He's always doing really interesting um, fills and always giving a kind of like real life force to the songs that is buoyed by the fact that the songs themselves are so catchy. Uh, it's a basically a quintessential power pop record. It is the best power pop record I've heard since the big star. Um, and, but it has this kind of like real adrenaline pumping nature to it that a lot of parapop doesn't have. And I think the Beth, the Beth deliberately steered away from that with their second record to make a different kind of record that didn't really gel with us. But I definitely highly recommend that for a Beth's album, Future Me Hates Me. It's very good. Um, and I'm pleased to finally be more on board with this New Zealand act who seemingly are beloved by people from every, just about every country except New Zealand, where most people here <laughs> probably don't know who they are, which is a shame. Anyway, so yeah, really enjoyed that. Wanted to shout that out. Uh, a couple other things I'll shout out. Re-listens this week. Uh, I was really taken by the a music writer I really love, A.A. Dowd, uh, wrote a list of a ranking of every single Weezer song. I think just over 200 Weezer songs with write-ups for every single song. And so I was like, okay, this is a really, I respect this undertaking because it, it's, you have to imagine the, the hours and sheer dedication it takes to yeah. write about every Weezer song. They're simply not being paid enough. No, exactly. And you can sense that this is a labor of love as well because it's written beautifully and it doesn't go easy on the band either. Like when the songs are bad, Dowd writes about their badness eloquently. Um, so and doesn't pull any punches. So I really enjoyed reading this list. But m the point being, it inspired me to revisit a record I've kind of had a bit of a love-hate relationship with. I've either hated it, but I've always kind of I've gone from feeling that it's a really strong record to feeling that it's a bit overrated over and over, uh, over the years. And that's Pinkerton, their legendary second record. Uh, but I listened to it this week and I swing firmly back into positive territory. I think it might even be, it might even edge out Blue potentially, even though Blue has a number of their best songs on it the unified concept of Pinkerton and how deeply Rivers Cuomo throws himself into it was it really struck me listening to it this time. And I have, I think, much more of an appreciation now than I used to for records that are willfully ugly and where the front men or front woman or front person 
deliberately kind of makes themselves doesn't try and like paint themselves in a particularly positive light is, is r- relentlessly self-effacing which rivers cuomo is on pinkerton uh, it's, it's an uncomfortable record to listen to it's a dark record it's also a very funny album and an, an aspect mm. of pinkerton that i think is not appreciated enough is its sense of humor uh like a song like pink triangle for instance is like <laughs> the whole concept of that song is hilarious like rivers cuomo not being not having his interests reciprocated by a girl so he basically convinces himself that this girl is gay and he leads into a chorus uh, which is like sim- simultaneously hilarious. Um, well, like the, the chorus starts with I'm dumb, she's a lesbian, which is one of the hilarious ways to yep. e- enter a chorus ever. But it culminates with this line that's simultaneously hilarious and incredibly tender, which is uh, if we're all a little gay, why can't she be a little straight? Which, I don't know, is a really moving line. One of my favorite lyrics that um, Rivers has ever written because it's ridiculous and stupid, but also there's a tenderness and a genuine emotionality to it that really re- resounded with me and co- tr- continues across the rest of the album as well. I was particularly taken with certain deep cuts that I think I'd never really given the time of day, like Falling for You, which is now one of my favorite Weezer songs. Love that track. A lot of really bizarre and, and unusual chord changes in it that make it stand out as a particularly, um, you know, unconventional. Uh, song for what it is and um, the closing track butterfly when you really absorb the, the the blow of the rest of the record that song that song's unexpected tenderness really hits a lot harder and it did for me this time as well uh, lead single El Scorcho still remains my favorite song on the record just because that is the most patently absurd and surrealist song that we've ever done like like it's got the stream of consciousness nature to the lyricism that's totally like nutso and i respect as well weezer making a record like blue which is this kind of very clean cut clean cut power pop record that had a lot of crowd pleasing singles uh, produced by rick okasik and then following it up with the lead single to their next record being this complete kind of punch in the face to people who value that slickness um, by being this really kind of like dingy, dirty garage rock sort of song with an absolutely fucking <laughs> addictive as hell chorus hook. I've always loved El Scorcho, but it only gets more and more um, firmly. God damn you half Japanese girls. Do it to me every time. Yeah, it, it's my, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it's, yeah. And you, this, the cool thing about it, though, is that even though it's a kind of subversion of expectations, you can still hear the same person who wrote Say It Ain't So deeply embedded in that song and basically every song on the record. And also just the cojones to uh, follow up a record with songs like Buddy Holly and the Sweater song on it. These really kind of like, again, like I say, clean cut, very kind of crowd pleasing rock songs with an album that opens with an ironic scourge about being having so much sex that you're over it it's it's like it, it, it's a really great record anyway i really enjoy it um and i feel like yeah it would be a good record club to do someday as well i, I always uh, associate pinkerton with the plane ride from new york to cincinnati when i was seeing uh jake and morgan sorry listen to it uh so i always have a lot of nostalgia for that album i love it i have a lot of affection yeah yeah, and the, the thing about the thing you, you appreciate about or the thing you come to accept as well is the more you realize the greatness of Pinkerton, the worse their other records become subsequent yeah. records anyway, because they they become so like such a stark refutation of all of the honesty of that record. Although you could make the argument that in a lot of the facile or in some of the facile music that Weezer have made in their later era, there is a kind of honesty in terms of uh, Rivers genuinely being a bit of a facile human being. Um, but that said, my, my biggest takeaway from that Weezer countdown list is that even though they have a lot of shitty albums, there's usually some gems hidden away within most of them, uh, even the worst ones. And so that alone, I think, makes the... And also just the really strange arc of Rivers Cuomo as a person makes the Weezer discography worth experiencing at least once, um, you know, I'll shout out briefly. I re-listened to um, the Yes's blown out double album Tales from Topographic Oceans, which is one of the most indulgent progressive rock albums ever made, unquestionably. And I yet I love it against the crazy. 
it's <laughs> Look, how it, uncharacteristic of us. I, I know. It's certainly not one of the, it's certainly not one of like the top three best yes albums, but it's not far off either. It does not need to be 80 minutes, but yet at the same time, there's so much different that's happening across that 80 minute runtime that it's this really, I find it a really kind of like enrapturing experience. And also just like it's four 20 minute tracks and two of them maintain perfection for 20 minutes, which is a pretty good achievement. The other two are decent, but could have been cut down. But I respect the, uh, the ambition of that record and uh, the fact that it does have about 50 to 60 minutes of perfection in it is impressive enough for me to forgive the parts that are a little more ponderous. Uh, that said, you know, it, it, it is one of the most overblown and bombastic prog records i've ever heard but it's not close to one of the most unbearable either so i'd still recommend it to people who want to have that experience but it's certainly not a, a record you should listen to if you're relatively new to yes unless you just want to be chaotic i guess anyway i also spent this week listening extensively to the discography of low whose new record we're going to be reviewing today a very curious band who i've had an affinity for for a number of years started out in, and it should be made clear since I, I know that I'm the probably the only person here who has like a history with them and it should be remarked that where they are now is a very different place from where they began and they began as this very kind of like Red House Painters-esque slowcore band in the 90s that um, made these absolutely devastatingly dark and nihilistic records that nonetheless were so beautiful in their melodic approach uh, I particularly recommend uh, I Could Live in Hope, their debut, and The Curtain Hits the Cast, if you want a taste of Red House Painters, Carissa's Weird-esque slowcore music that is really good for wallowing in if you need a soundtrack for that. Um, if you want some more kind of melodically direct and hard-hitting stuff, I recommend the Steve Albini-produced Things We Lost in the Fire from 2001, which is their most accessible record. And then you have this weird direction that they've gone in in recent years of kind of distorting and electrif electrifying their sound um, that we'll discuss shortly, I guess. But yeah, that's been my week. And let's move on to our first record that we're going to be discussing today, which is... How did we get here? Oh, how, how did we get here? Because I know that I, I, I think I probably might have a slightly larger affinity for Golden Hour than maybe most of the podcast generally. I don't know that. I could be wrong. But I really enjoyed that record in 2018. In fact, that record was a big part of me making the step towards actually embracing certain aspects of country music and Americana or whatever you want to describe it as. I think that record was a gateway for a lot of people into that world. Not to say that it's terribly representative of it. Like a lot of what people remark on about Golden Era is the way that it is, you know, a country record by a country artist that nonetheless is produced as a pop record and has a lot of kind of electronic synths and stuff and and production and that is more much more akin of a pop record and so it was bringing those two worlds together in a much more compelling way than someone like taylor swift ever did in my opinion anyway so that's what attracted me to golden hour in 2018 and it was a it was a celebrated record um did incredibly well um swept the grammys and really felt like a culmination for Casey as well. I know I'm not intimately familiar with the records that precede it, but I know that people like Connor are big fans of records like Same Trailer, Different Park and Pageant Material. Those are mm. really critically acclaimed records that uh, represented a more humble and modest beginning for Casey, but also a place where she was very much rooted in songwriting uh, and, and to demonstrate a lot of strengths And with that. And then Golden Hour was this beautiful culmination of all of that. And... I think Starcrossed is pretty, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most disappointing album of 2021. And there are contenders. Like I, even though I liked it, um, as we definitely went into, I think that up until this point, I was hard pressed to say there would be, there was a more disappointing album this year than Lord's Record, uh, which, you know, I liked it a decent amount, I know, and, and a lot of people hated. And same sort of thing with the St. Vincent record, which I still like have a po I generally positive feelings for, but compared to some of her previous output was something of a letdown. So it was like, okay, we had these kind of a bit 
disappointing moments from artists that I loved at least. But I was very optimistic about this Casey Musgraves record. And the reason I was very optimistic about it is that there was a lot of building it up. And Casey was talking about the ambition that she had for this record, the integration of artists like Daft Punk and all of these very non-country people in, into this world and her desire to expand the realm of her production soundscapes, listening to a lot of artists like Bill Withers and Sade and Eagles and Weezer and, and, and painting it as this uh, concept tragedy uh, inspired by Romeo and Juliet. Like she had this very clear and ambitious vision for this record that she would tease out during the production of this album. And I was on board. Like, I feel like a fucking idiot. I, I've never felt more like I have fucking clown makeup on than I do for thinking this record was going to be the, the goddamn shoes. The, the album you're like vicariously describing with her quotes is unrecognizable. Well, this is to, um, Every, yeah, from everything have. that she said I was convinced this was going to be a masterpiece I was convinced she was going to build on Golden Hour even further and make some like not in terms of uh, like when she painted it as it going to be a divorce album that's my most ambitious thing yet I was picturing Casey Musgraves My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy and I was getting <laughs> like so I, you know I d it did remind me of that in some places well, and that's a that's a fucking terrible idea <laughs> is the problem with that See, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad idea i just feel like that well it's a bad idea to be lifting sonic ideas from my beautiful dark twisted fantasy and trying to adapt them sure, poorly i just mean that. i just mean the notion of like a, an artist completely bearing their soul no, at yeah, their certainly. lowest moment and just making the yeah. most biggest anthemic music of their career around that soul bearing and that seemed to me to be what casey was doing and then there was a certain point where it became apparent that that wasn't exactly what it was going to be. Like, I think there was an interview where she said that the record was going to be focused more on, um, you know, moving on and, and gathering up the broken pieces or whatever, and, and that it would be more focused around ballads and stuff. And I was like, fine, sure, whatever. I mean, she's a country artist at heart, right? So, I mean, what can I expect, really? She doesn't want to alienate too many people. And, and, and then it's just this, absolutely anodyne soulless well actually it's not really fair to call it soulless because i do think there's a lot of genuine emotion in it but it is yet and yet and yet and yet it, it feels utterly emotionless like even when casey is trying to i mean there are some moments i think that are some of the stronger moments here where casey is really like like camera roll for instance where she's you get a real sense of the genuine um you know pathos of the thing that she's experiencing but she's so, she, she fails so spectacularly to translate that into compelling music and into compelling mm -hmm. emotion on this record, despite the or fact compelling that- Compelling songwriting. In yeah, and, and despite the fact that you can yeah. see like that it's a song cycle, right? Like that it's got a, a linear narrative that starts out with the, the marriage itself and, and Casey's hopes for it. And then the general gradual disintegration, the division between her and her partner, and then Casey's emptiness in the wake of the divorce itself. And then her picking herself up again. The problem is that Casey communicates all of this in the most uninteresting way possible. Like her lyricism. <laughs> Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. I mean, I, I, I think that, I, I think this is worse than most Taylor Swift records. I, I, I would agree. The thing it's just is, a very similar kind of shite songwriting. The thing is, is that Casey, Casey's lyricism on this album is so like pedestrian. Like it's- oh, yeah. That's my biggest problem with it. Like, if, if, I, if I could just go off it's on like this a cool. quick moment. Yeah, I love that. Go off, Sersha, please. Like, that was my biggest problem with this album is, like, I feel like the arc you were going for, but the, like, I feel like what I love about Casey Musgraves' best records before Golden Hour, which I still really like, is, like, the incisive details that are observed of like people that aren't her but that she's around yeah. and, and I feel like as soon as she is asked to make those observations about her own life 
there's just she isn't willing to ironically she isn't willing to be as like self critical and self investigatory as something like Dying Star by Russ and Kelly <laughs> to be incredibly ironic yeah so like she wants to talk about how she wants to be a, a good wife like but it's in the most mundane images and details possible and uh, this this came to a head for me on the track breadwinner which i feel is representative of so many of the pros and cons of this record and that like the instrumental has a lovely like melody and beat and groove to it and it's got a nice flow but when she, she's trying to express the idea that like her husband is uh, a bit of like a charisma leech or a gold digger by saying he's a breadwinner and he wants your dinner. I, I can't hear that and not laugh out loud. It's just so such a clunky, ridiculous rhyme. He and wants a so- breadwinner. He wants <laughs> your dinner. He wants- it's the most like it's just such a dead melody in that song. Like and and the thing is the emotions at the core of the song like I feel that Casey is very fair on her partner I I, I feel I don't feel that this is in a, a record that is kind of necessarily attacking someone for being a bad husband like it's like you weren't the, the thing I needed and I wasn't the thing you needed and that's why this could never work I think Casey is reasonably fair about the situation generally speaking but that's a different thing to talking about how well she actually writes these songs that's more of a kind mm. of macro aspect of the record uh, and I think Breadwinner is a good example of Casey zeroing in on something that has the power to be quite potent like actually saying like I'm doing a lot of self-reflection on this record but also I would be doing myself a disservice if I were to you know lay all the blame upon me for not being right for this thing there are certain aspects of the shit that you do like that's maybe not your fault but just an aspect of your personality where you're a little bit insecure and that results in certain the times where we're together and there's a tension between us that there shouldn't be. And that is a compelling idea for a song, uh, especially within the context of this tapestry of songs about this beautiful relationship falling apart. It's just this, the problem is that Breadwinner is just really like two-dimensional, like cartoonish almost song that, yeah, like you say, Sersha, it, it uses this really kind of blunt and, and mundane and, and, and really mm. just uninspiring imagery to try and communicate the situation. And, and Breadwinner is also a song that has like one of the worst sounding synths I've ever heard. And it comes in right before the chorus and it sounds like a fucking wet fart. It is so distracting and terrible sounding. That, that, that I, thing, like on, on that second track she talks about wanting to be a good wife but like bring her husband coffee in bed and it's like that's not well, what you want yeah. to be getting at i i think she's kind of like she she's she's trying to highlight the problems with this idealistic vision of how to be a good wife and the fact that she could never fit into that i i, I think that there's a seed seeds of good songwriting there and i think the line about if he comes home stressed i'll pack him a bowl is quite funny um just because you don't get that kind of like uh direct allusion to domestic you know smoking weed together in a lot of uh love songs but yeah you're right the the rest of it is I just feel like Casey could dive deeper into these scenarios and aspects of the relationship than she does. She paints these broad images that are often very much tied into this really kind of lame allusion to the star-crossed lovers thing and just is content to let that sit there and then while she iterates these really dull hooks over and over and over again. And and, uh, there are certain songs that- absolutely there's certain songs towards the latter half of the record as well, where it gets even worse in that regard, because you have Casey just leaning further and further into this meaningless cliche, like in songs like keep looking up, for example, which is just a a nothing song. Like there's nothing going on in that track. There's lyrically musically, like it is, it it is a fucking, it is a, a mom, a mum quote on the wall of the living room. It's, it's nothing. Uh, and and you're right as well. Like there's so much to talk about about why this record's bad. The you are right to point out that just awful synth as well, August, because there's another awful synth on the song. What doesn't kill me as well, which a- absolutely just 
drecks that song and this is another aspect of the record that's oh, that's God. and I'll, I'll shut up in a sec because i can tell you want to build on mm. what i'm saying but this yeah. is another aspect of the record which is that it sounds so bad like it, it just doesn't sound good like it, it sounds like it, the best parts of it sound bland and the worst parts of it are confusing in terms of the way that they sound, in terms of mixing and, and just general construction of, a, of an atmosphere. It's one of the most, it's one of the least atmospheric, atmospheric albums I've heard in recent years. It's utterly just synthetic and, and dulled and so lifeless. I, I would argue the worst parts of this album sound offensive almost because on cherry blossoms we've got this fucking chopstick music piano part right like during oh, the verses yeah, yeah which is she's like, like she's like does that thing where it's like instead of rome wasn't built in a day she says tokyo wasn't built in a day because tokyo the city of cherry blossoms and she's comparing us you know using that imagery of cherry blossom as like a doting loving thing and it's yeah yeah just and vomit and that's, inducing and that's just embarrassing. And then there's also the last track here, oh, oh, which is God. <laughs> equally an embarrassing pastiche of Latin American culture and music. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's like, I, you'd have, we, we, we would need a whiteboard to try and unpack everything that's wrong and misguided about the musical decisions on songs like that. Uh, uh, and yeah. And then there's the lower end of this album, which sounds like hot garbage. Just awful. When, they, when there's an attempt at a bass part, it, what are we doing here? This is, this is amateur. There's it like doesn't, a, it's there, not professional. There, there are certain songs on here where she goes for like a loungy or sound. Like there's one song that even reminded me a little bit of like a down tempo track from the early 2000s and some of the atmosphere. I can't remember which one, but like the thing is, is that it's so, again, I keep coming back to these same words. It's so lifeless. There's no weight even in the, you know, the gentler moments. The bass, as you say, is almost absent. Like there are points where you can hear it very muted and you're like, this should be like, I, I mean, I'm going to say it. Jack Antonoff should have produced this because Jack Antonoff would have put the fucking bass in the front of the mix on these songs because he's good at doing that. And no, I, this is a case where I will concede his sound would have been better for it. it he would have, I might have still found it bland in parts, but oh, yeah. at least it, it would have still like, at, at least bland would be the floor and not the ceiling here. Yeah, I mean, you're right, because there's two, fail there's two made, well, even three major failures that's happening here. There's failure in uh, production, there's a failure in mixing, and there's a failure in songwriting. And I contend that if you had someone like Jack Antonoff produce this, that you would at least overcome the production failures so that such that the musical vision of this, whatever, if you want to get call it that, would be less grating than the, the, the way that it appears here. But it wouldn't, of course, overcome the failure in mixing and the failure more prominently in songwriting, which we've already started to touch on. We're suitably, we're kind of piecemealing this review and we're going all over the shop because this is an album that it's sloppy. It's really yeah. sloppy. And it I sounds can't... borderline unfinished. It's flaws are codependent as well. So you kind of have to be sloppy yeah. in that way, reviewing it. Yeah, exactly. Like there's one song on here that has a memorable hook. One song that has a memorable hook. And that's justified. Which I, I, the, yeah, I think that's that's the like justified is way too good for this album. And it's like <laughs> a decent song. Yeah. 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 Like I justified I've actually had stuck in my head off and on for the last few days because that hook is so good. And I mean it's not a great song, but it's it's a great hook and it has it feels like it gets it understands the emotional it communi well i think casey understands the emotional com complexity of the situation she's in because obviously she's experienced that and she's a grown human being but her ability to communicate that emotional complexity is limited on a lot of songs on this record but it's not limited on justified which feels like it understands like Casey's own limitations as a wife, Casey's own limitations within relationships, Casey's own 
inability to understand, but also like Casey's own helplessness within the situation. And, and it's, it's really like, again, emotionally quite potent, I think. And there's also a similar sense of potency on camera roll, which is the other reasonable standout here. Although I will say that musically, it's much less compelling than Justified is. But it has my favorite moment on the record, which is the end of the song where Casey has this beautiful sentiment where it's like, thank you, thanks for all the nights and days and everything you gave, I'll never erase it. There's one where we look so in love before we lost all the sun and I made you take it. There's that's a great double meaning on that line where she's talking about looking through old photos on her phone of when she was with her partner. And this line of, the, and this idea of like not being able to erase those photos and the inherent hypocrisy in that when you compare it to the idea of moving forward that the rest of this record is so staunchly about. So I feel like this is a, a great moment of, uh, Casey acknowledging that and that line where she says there's one photo where we look so in love before we lost all the sun and I made you take it like that's a great double meaning because he, he, she's like suggesting that she made him take the photo but also that she made him take all the sun away because of the way that she interacted with him uh, in the context of their relationship and it works as a kind of counterpoint to breadwinner in theory as well, because that's where she shows the other side of it, where he's not communicating and where he's like being insecure and, and, and stuff. And so, again, this moment is so powerful as an individual moment, and it's just not supported. It's not given a bedrock that it needs to really leave that profound impact that it should have. And I, I'm being really generous in describing these individual moments because i feel like if i'm not then i, I i'm just going to have to be completely shitting on this album relentlessly and i don't want to do that yeah, exactly definitely. because i do i don't want to shit on it exclusively because i do think that again there's a core of, of something quite emotionally powerful in here that is never capitalized on except for fleeting fleeting moments and even then there's very few of them that was my immediate thought coming away from the record, which is like, it has its moments. And by that, I mean moments where it, I feel like I've really gone under the skin of the character presenting the story to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they are so like few and far between that they never coalesce into a portrait, you know? Yeah. Another thing that I think is a limitation of the record is in terms of failure of concept is that so Casey's envisioned this as a tragic story about star-crossed lovers that are meant to be together falling out and yet you never ever get a sense that there was ever anything harmonious about her relationship between with with Rustin on this record like this record starts presenting this theme and immediately the cracks are there and it's falling apart and the marriage is over within a few songs and so it's like that rot that failure to actually depict the beauty of the marriage that supposedly she wants us to believe is there absolutely guts this whole concept because you don't get a sense of a loss at all because everything feels like it's already lost when the album begins emotionally so it's a complete failure of concept because if you want to do this romeo and juliet thing which i think is a hilariously weird thing to compare this story to because these lovers who are meant to be together but who were you know driven apart and died because of forces outside of their control how does that work as an analog for a relationship that falls apart because of individual aspects of your own personalities that don't work together well at all like it's not a good analog for this marriage romeo and juliet it just doesn't no. fit at all it, and it, it, it feels yeah. really cheap that she's invoking it um it, because it feels like what a high schooler would do honestly like you've only read shakespeare like you've only read romeo and juliet and so this is like what your idea of like a relationship falling apart is, I guess. It's it, like the thing that I really gets get me it. is that it's Casey is better than this. Like I've, I've she's she a good is. songwriter. She's not a fucking, you know, a Pulitzer winner or whatever, but she, she's not fucking Bob Dylan. She never has been, but she's been a really strong songwriter in the past. And she's communicated like these kinds of painful emotions well before, but I, this whole concept, as I've said, it just doesn't get started, let alone fail beyond that, because you don't get a sense of any real emotional weight here. It, it's yeah. just like, I want to be a good wife. Things are going wrong. I'm single. 
but it's okay because there's hope. <laughs> Another thing that completely guts the narrative is that like we don't know who these people are. Like I don't care. I don't because like it's it's clearly not a hundred percent, you know, autobiographical. Because Rust and Kelly was not the fucking breadwinner of that household, for one thing. Well, that that to be fair, she said he wants a breadwinner and not he's a breadwinner. Like he he wants he's reliant on her to sponge right. off of, but also he is jealous of her. I think is the conceit of that song. To be fair. Oh but, yeah. right. Well, I mean, how oh how could I have forgotten? <laughs> um, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> anyway point is it's if it's reliant upon the sort of idea that we know who these people are for real then that's i mean that you just you you still suck at writing about that you and another thing yeah is is you just you fucking you tell a story if you're gonna tell a story it should be like oh, we were Me- together and now we're not hey you- purely out of coincidence as soon as i finished my first listen of this i threw on the perfect sounds podcast episode about lemonade by beyonce um never making that connection by the way before i listened to that podcast um but that's the thing where if like all of my problems with this album are kind of not there on that album where it's like that is a record where beyonce is very able to look inside oneself and challenge one's own um sort of view of the of the story and that's really the biggest problem is that i feel like the reason these rhymes are so facile and these images are so two-dimensional is that there's it's like there's a wall of emotional honesty with oneself that central i'm going to say casey because it's a narrative album like the the central character of this record that's telling the story to you feels unwilling to investigate themselves on those terms. And I think it presents a wall to accessibility as a writer to depict that character um, that hinders the album. And that's not, a pro- that's not a problem like Lemonade ever has. And you understand who these people are outside of their celebrity personas. And it's a fully fledged narrative with a really satisfying finale at the end. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that's it. Like it just fails to convince you that the people involved in these stories are real like it's too it's too you have with these kinds of things especially the way that casey's tried to frame it you want to get to this gritty emotional truth of this ugly situation and it's it's as she says like on one song golden hour faded black it is the in, intended to be the inverse of that last record where that last record was a picture of her pure happiness and this loving state that she's in and this is supposed to be the flip side that shows the uglier emotional reality and yet you don't get it's 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 that the emotional reality for the most part is expressed purely through platitude and so you don't get a sense that it feels like casey wants to have her cake and eat it too in the sense that she doesn't want to reveal herself to her audience she wants to maintain her own privacy and yet at the same time she wants to be perceived as opening up in a way that's really vulnerable and yet there's I mean, there's one moment on here that I think, another moment on here that I think there is some genuine vulnerability to a certain extent, which is hookup scene, where she talks about, you know, the isolating nature of being single after being in a marriage when you're a little bit older than you were when when dating was a bit more natural. And the, the there's a really kind of genuine emotion here of almost like regret in a certain extent, where she's advising the listener to be grateful for what they have um, they may not realize that actually the frictions they're experiencing ultimately aren't all that bad and won't necessarily and might necessarily be something that's more preferable to being totally alone. And that's a, a nice little emotion buried away in this song. But, but I wish there were more of that. I wish there were more of, of that real sense of getting a real sense of, of Casey's hopelessness like even in this song where she's advising the audience to be grateful for what they have it feels like casey's taking a a state of weakness and turning herself into the strong hero who has learned this wise lesson and is imparting it upon the listener rather than someone who's broken by the experience and 
uh, you know, and is essentially in a state of desperation. And look, I'm not saying that women like Casey have to be, you know, totally eschewing that popular dominant thing of the strong woman or whatever. Like it's fine to want to embrace that as a part of your narrative arc, but it feels kind of unearned and weirdly contradictory uh, with the the attempt to be genuinely genuinely vulnerable. And look, I concede that it's an experience I can't really comment on. Um, and also I want to acknowledge as well, like, and I this is more just covering our asses. I don't think anyone is actually going to be critical of us for this, but we're generally avowed fans of Rust and Kelly. And so, you know, there could be a, a sense that we're in a sense but going to experience some kind of bias um, because we really love his music and maybe feel a bit more of a disconnect with Casey's music and hear this album is about how her relationship with him has fallen apart. But I think that thankfully there is plenty to be quite clearly critical of that doesn't rely on whether Casey is fully depicted of her relationship or not, which I don't frankly give a fuck about. No. Um, but yeah. That's the thing about that is that, that that's actually really funny to me that like the idea that anyone would throw that at us because the writing on this album is so fucking intangible. It could be about anyone or anything at any point in time and none of it fucking matters because there's a fucking narrative glued onto this album and it just doesn't fit because I don't think there was much of a story between her and Rustin falling out. At least mm-hmm. not that they revealed from the looks of things. It's like, I just, we just weren't right for each other. And like, you can make that really compelling, but you don't have to fucking Ziggy start us the fucking thing. It's weird. It doesn't like, make any I mean, sense. I, I think of, um, an album you're going to roll your eyes at, but it's appropriate. Um, I think of Tallahassee with this fucking, record where there we go. I'm ready for it. It's, it's, it's only fitting this is done one last time. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> no, like that's a concept album about a breakup of two people where you generally understand what they see in each other and the fall apart is depicted and like you feel it because you see what is wrong in both of those people to at least the dissolution, I mm. guess. And I think the difference is obviously that record is fictional. And here with this album, it's like Casey wants to be autobiographical, but it's almost like she, as I said before, she can't really commit to being fully honest, either because she doesn't want to, or she doesn't want to break Rustin's privacy or her own privacy or whatever. And so you just get this real half measure of a record that doesn't really feel like it's telling you much of anything. And yeah, I, I, and, and, I wanna, and worse yet, doesn't sound like anything. Yes, and this ties into the next thing I want to bring up because I want to integrate something that Jake has passed on in his notes, which I is a I think a something we've briefly alluded to, but I think would make a good thing to move on to now, which is just how bad this record sounds. Uh, it, it, it's the thing is, is that it sucks. It, it sounds compressed as hell. Uh, and, and, and in its best moments, it, that compression is less noticeable. But for the most part, if you're listening to this with headphones on, if you're trying to take in these mixes, it's headache inducing. And it, it's it's tacky in Jake's words. And, and it, it feels more tacky than ugly than it, it feels more often tacky and ugly than it communicates any kind of emotional darkness or melancholy, or whatever the intended effect might be, which is what Jake has written. And so it becomes just, frustrating and infuriating and confusing in the same way that all of these other flaws of the record is. Um, Jake's also noted that occasionally the reverb makes songs sound pretty and spacious, but oftentimes clashes with the compressed artificial drums and instrumentation, especially on songs like Cherry Blossom, which August has mentioned. And any time an unadorned piece of instrumentation appears, it almost feels out of place. And I would even cite what should be a musical highlight for me because I fucking love whenever artists do this. There's a flute solo on There Is The Light. And I fucking love when artists put flute in their music. Like Lizzo, whoever, go the fuck off. A flute is always cool, in my opinion. And it sounds so weirdly out of place here and just doesn't do anything to lift the song. It doesn't help that There Is A Light is one of the most anonymous fucking boring songs in the whole record already. I mean... Jeez, 
what do you say about yeah, the, the sound of this it's, record? It's a shitty flute solo, and I'm like, that's that's like the most interesting thing that happened in that album for like the entire last third. <sighs> yeah, it's I. Why is this not a country record? That's a good question as well, because if Casey is it's really, really trying to, if, if Casey is really trying to pivot into this pop world, if she's trying to be a pop star, she's doing a pretty fucking shitty job of terrible, it. bad because job. These are mm. not pop songs. I mean, justified. I mean, some of them are like, you know, skeletal pop song sketches, but only justified, I would say, really feels like it was designed yeah, to be a pop song. And that's yeah. why that's like the best moment on here because that's the song that feels it f- understands what it is and also to some degree, to a limited degree, executes what it is. Uh, and nothing else on here really comes close to that same level of just assuredness and its concept and its idea and like you know country music there's a lot of great country artists you really in it's like really best in my opinion when it's really just heavily inflected with a lot of emotion and and personal storytelling and it's almost like the pop elements are like knowingly or not trying to be at odds with that and just depersonalizing it Casey Musgraves is a country artist and she has decided to become a pop artist on the most thematically relevant country material that she's ever had. Well, what and country music thrives of authenticity that this album thoroughly fails to project. And what this album feels like to me is like, in the world of cinema, what you see a lot is like filmmakers who are in genre cinema trying to make like conventional dramas and people who are known for conventional dramas trying to make genre films and it always comes across not always but a lot of the time comes across like they've just taken the like the blandest elements of the genres that they want to make and have constructed the whole thing around these incredibly bland elements of this Mm. thing that's outside of their um ball outside of their repertoire and this album bit like you know, it feels a bit like Oz the Great and Powerful by Sam Raimi. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's, wow. that's oh, I think, God. that's, I think, a, an auspicious note to end on. So let's, I think, move into our favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, I'll read out Jake's first. Uh, Jake's favorite tracks are Hook Up Scene, Justified, and There Is a Light. His least favorite track is Cherry Blossom. And Jake gives the album a 5.5. Amazing. Uh, my favorite songs are uh, Justified, a uh, hookup scene, and uh, Chinese Satellite. Fuck. My least favorite is Cherry Blossoms. Uh, and this album's getting a two and a half from me. Me. My favorite tracks are uh, the television show with Timothy Oliphant known as Justified. Um, the fucking uh, the other one and uh, wh- whatever. At least favorite is Good Wife just because the autotune on that chorus is fucking that was, that was a choice that was made and it should have been unmade. Yeah, I'll give this a four. Um, well, for me, I just want to say, um, for the sake of all of you, and cut this out if it's boring, but I was just in the kitchen refilling my drink, talking to my flatmate and telling them that we were talking about Casey Musgraves' divorce album. And they were like, there's nothing like a good divorce album. And I said to them, you're right, there is nothing like a good divorce album. And this is nothing like a good divorce album. Anyway. Um, it's, it's uh, my favorite tracks are probably Justified. Um, I say there was like, so I actually did kind of like the flute solo, and I can see where you're coming from, but it was like a relief from the instrumental homogeny. I don't, um, I mean, yeah, I, I props to the flute, the floor test did it, they put their fucking pussy into it. Respect, it's just a song that doesn't earn a flute solo, in my opinion. I won't disagree. 
Uh, and I'll say hookup scene probably least favorite track. Just, just can't, I can't get past he wants your dinner. I can't get past it. <laughs> um, it's, it's getting a four from me. <laughs> Fellas is hungry. <laughs> Oh, hey, I, uh, yeah. So my three favorite tracks are uh, Justin Timberlake's debut solo record, Justified. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> camera roll <laughs> and um, hookup scene. Uh, my least favorite track is we didn't even really talk about it because I mean, where to begin with the atrocious series of bad decisions made on the closing track of this record, Gracias a la Vida. Mm. Uh, it's like every way in which a song can sound bad in one song. Like it's like they yep. veer from <laughs> one bad mixing idea to another for no apparent reason. And it's also hilarious because this song is a cover of a track that was like originally written by, let me get this right, Violeta Parara as a suicide note saying like, goodbye to the world and thank you for all you've given me. And it's such a fucking weird emotional note to end a record on when you've just had a track that's basically about how, you know, there's hope, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, there's a light, whatever fucking cliche to end on this note of like singing this suicide song is uh, yeah. inspiring. Spanish, which you know, it's shit. It's awful. It's bad. White. I also want to say and fuck you to the song. If this was a movie, forgetting that Hannah Montana song of the same name stuck in my head for half of this week. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then God bless you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm giving it a three point five. Okay, legit. So that's. Are you ready? An average of three point nine. Um. <laughs> Which we don't have a 3.9 average yet, but the closest we have is uh, a 3.8 for Positions by Ariana Grande and The Sun Came by Sufjan Stevens. I mean, Positions, another anonymous pop record that should have been a lot better than it was. I don't um, think I listened to that. No, you weren't on that episode. Why the fuck would you listen to it? <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway. Just Morgan in his spare time, like, you know what I'm going to listen to? I'm going to listen to yeah, Positions just... by Ariana Grande. <laughs> Anyway, mm. let's let's uh, sink even lower with uh, our second review of the day, which is Low are one of the most enduring and beloved bands of the 90s slowcore scene. Uh, slowcore, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like an offshoot of talk talk bark psychosis-esque variants of post-rock where the idea is uh, basic rock instrumentation guitar bass drums vocals but really strips down into this very minimal slow paced as you would assume from the genre title um, or at times even quite ambient variant of of songwriting uh, they made a number of uh, classic records in this vein uh, in the 90s, including I Could Live in Hope, The Curtain Hits the Cast, Secret Name, uh, Things We Lost in the Fire, records I mentioned earlier in the episode as records I really love. Um, and so they basically have carved out this particular niche in the slowcore scene and made a lot of the most important and influential records in that vein, uh, very much uh, in the vein of other bands like Red House Painters and Carissa's Weird. Um, so yeah, and they've had their a, a married couple Ellen Sparhawk and Mimi Parker um, from Duluth, Minnesota. And so they've been doing, plugging away at this particular variant of their sound for coming up on three decades. And they've had one of the most remarkably consistent discographies for a band working with a rather limited palette, which is not to say all their records have been great, but they've had a pretty strong hit rate. Although it has to be said that following the mid 2000s records, The Great Destroyer and uh, that record specifically, which was a, a really strong record produced by Dave Fridman, they kind of moved into a slightly more anonymous and languorous zone, kind of not really sure of how to develop their sound from there. And that all changed in the middle of the last decade when they began collaborating with the producer BJ Burton, who has worked with a lot of pop artists, most notably Charlie XCX, to craft like 
songs that focus on like more extreme variants of particular sounds and use elements like distortion and strange electronic atmospheres to add this weight to the music and so this is they worked they began working with bj burton on with their album ones and sixes which marked a real up a real step up moment from the records that preceded it in my opinion and then that collaboration really came to fruition on 2018's double negative which was one of their most well regarded and esteemed records in years and i think is uh one of the best records they've ever made an absolutely astounding uh piece of weirdly haunted glitchy pop music that if it feels like a series of death rattles of pop songs that have these really ghostly vocals at the center of them however notably on that record the vocals of alan sparhawk and mimi parker were often lathered in effects and auto-tune and weird uh, ways of manipulating them to make them sound almost alien and give that whole record a feel of like an alien transmission uh, however hey what which is the third consecutive collaboration with bj burton kind of takes the general aesthetic sonically of do double negative and takes it in a much more I, this kind of sounds like a really kind of cliche thing or a dumb thing to say but a much more human direction uh, a lot of the vocal effects, in fact, basically all of the vocal effects are stripped away and you have Alan and Mimi singing in a much clearer and more impactful way on this record. And where that weirdness and vocal effects has gone is into the mixes of these songs, which are incredibly distorted, incredibly compressed. And um, I think the thing with Low that, and, and particularly this particular record and era of Low, the thing to appreciate is that this isn't really like a rock band making an electronic record. This is a kind of ambient band making a weird soundscapey album that has these really moving vocal performances at the center of it, in my opinion, and is focused heavily on the atmosphere that swells around these vocal performances. But your mileage with this kind of thing will vary to the extent that you can gel with the palette that they're working with and with the minimalism within that palette. It is quite a haunting and moving record, I think. It's, and I think it benefits from the stronger lyrical focus that it has on this record not even lyrical focus because it's not even about the lyrics as much as just the vocal presence being quite compelling on these songs and particularly on tracks like my favorite song on this record hey the way in which mimi parker's vocals kind of weave in and out of this textural um, tapestry of beautiful synths and sounds um, whereas you have other moments like Days Like These, which is another song I love on this record, where the vocals are much more front and center and present and eventually kind of dissolve into this soundscape. Um, there's lots more to talk about with the ways in which they experiment with this uh, approach on this record, but I, I'm curious to hear since you guys are less familiar with Low than I am, what your experience was listening to this, uh, what you kind of expected versus what you got, and how you find this to be as an album experience. I enjoyed this pretty well. Def I, I, I definitely think the vocal contributions on both parts is, and the way they harmonize together is definitely the biggest hook for me. And I, and I think without them... I wouldn't exactly have a way into the sort of, I wouldn't have a way into the sort of sonic ideas that are being explored on the album as directly at any rate, but I feel like they kind of serve as the, the key to unlocking what exactly is going on here. This was a, on, on one hand for me, equally like frustrating and fascinating because I, what I really loved and got along with on here was that kind of merger of like ambient stuff and the like industrial, harsher, almost just pure noise parts of this record, which I thought that to me was the real highlight, being able to take that and put it into almost a, a pop structure and just a really weird kind of unique way i really i i liked that a lot i think the this 
it it's just an overwhelming album to just sit down and to listen to because it is mastered very loudly i found even at like a moderate volume on my speakers it was just overtaking me completely and that's that's where i felt that noise stuff really stuck with me and where it really worked uh but then i found i found myself not as compelled by the more ambient pop parts of this record and i and that's just kind of where I'll open on and I, I'll get deeper into, you know, thoughts as we get a little further into the review. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from. That helps that I know you reasonably well, August, and I know what you like and, and dislike in music. And I think that a big strength of this record as well is just the general aggression that it has in terms of that production approach like it's really hammered in quite effectively on the opening track white horses which has this Absolutely. really kind of like distorted um i love how kind of like it's almost like minimalist and simple to the point of being like barely even a musical idea and yet they use this like punching synth tone that grates and grates into the mix and these yeah like you say like really uh, compressed and, and heavily mixed and mastered vocals which are like almost uncomfortably feels like you're hearing them like inside they're, they're singing like inside of your ear which I I don't know if that communicates how it sounds very well but that's the impression I get anyway and um, I think also that aspect of the music is done quite powerfully as well on the song all nights too which i found to be one of the most kind of like flooring pieces on this record in terms of just like the hugeness of the soundscape and the way in which mimi parker's voice kind of like she's just modulating between notes but there's a grandeur to her and, and yet the smallness to her and the scope of everything around her that is so like dwarfing and, and powerful and this is something that jake has commented on as well who incidentally is broadly positive on this record but feels that the song structures are not quite as developed as he personally would have liked them to be and kind of drift a little bit too much um, but he did cite all night as a song that really has this overpowering beauty and a challenging oppression that he really really enjoyed and i guess where i veer veer from the, that aspect that Jake and August enjoy into a more broader enjoyment is that I find the dreamier parts of this record to be quite powerful as well. Like I've already cited Hay, which I think is just this beautiful seven minute trip through abyssal, gorgeous soundscapes and that are anchored by Mimi's voice, which is such a subtle and like kind of like small voice, but quite a powerful one as well. Um, and, and the way in which that central hey refrain becomes almost like a hypnotic mantra as she's reaching out and that's another thing that I guess to get a little bit conceptual but not too conceptual that I like about this record is that lower a band made up of a husband and wife who uh, have essentially been singing to each other for 30 years uh, and they comment on their relationship and the weird sense in which they're both this unified singular unit and these two distinct people that are drifting apart and then close together again as they get through their lives across this record and I think they quite powerfully communicate that in songs like Don't Walk Away as well that chorus refrain of I've slept beside you now for what seems a thousand years a shadow in your night the whisper in your ears is I, I feel quite a powerful way of conveying the grandiosity of their relationship and the way that that obviously has come to define their artistic identities as well and uh view i love also the way that you a, a somewhat conventional song from what seems like a somewhat conventional song like days like these um which again has that great like highly mastered vocal that comes in like a lightning bolt out of the sudden cut from the track before it but I love the way those vocals eventually drift about and you have this, my favorite uh, musical detail on this whole record, which is in the latter half of days like these, you have this utterly 
gorgeous little synthesizer solo that kind of comes into this landscape and starts to kind of dance across it and it's so oh, yeah. beautiful i love no, little moments like, like that was that days like these was one of my favorite songs on here i thought that was just a really amazing combination of the sounds on here i thought Mwah. yeah brilliant stuff nice Sersha, what do you think of this record uh i love this record i loved it it's, it's one of those records where it's like um i can be aware the whole time of perspectives that could see problems in it if you make sense or ways you could not get on with it i that is not the way i interact with it at all um i especially love the way that up until days like these the first five tracks blend into each other it makes it feel like such a cohesive album experience up until then and it makes the the incredibly melodic dates like these be such a stark contrast that it only hammers home the uh, power of the melodies in that song it felt like such a like cathartic experience for me uh, um but felt so um like texturally emotionally in touch with like the current moment um mm. in a way where it's like there's a deep catharsis in here somewhere through a lot of very harsh noise and melody lyrically it reminded me a lot of um, an album we talked about before that being by another slow core artist that being drinking songs by matt elliott um i can see where you'd pick up on that um particular aspect yeah like um the thing is about this record is that it's a record of fundamentally simple elements like even the lyricism itself utilizes a lot of repetition but i think in quite a, a powerful way like the, the 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 you can have an album that is constructed of reasonably simple and uncomplicated elements and you can make it work if each of those is given a weight that it wouldn't be able to have if it were complicated and I think this record does a good job of that. Like on I Can Wait, for example, you have a reasonably simple kind of repetitive lyrical motif that pulls you in and has this kind of a sense of emotional gravity to it as you get these different variations of the same kind of repetitive rhyme scheme. And this fractured picture of this weirdly disconnected place that the singer is in get, becomes clearer as the song goes on, this sense of discomfort. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have a song like More, which is probably the loudest song on this record, a two minute noisy guitar thrash that, I mean, the sound of the guitar on this track, it's a short track, but it sounds like a fucking buzzsaw. Like it sounds like it is literally caving your head in when you listen to it with headphones with the volume up. And I love the contrast between that heavy, uh, noisy guitar loop and these very kind of plaintive vocals and la 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 refrains like each of these are simple elements but together they're given such a gravity in these mixes that uh, I mean it must have been a nightmare to mix that song and just not have everything be drowned out by that guitar and yet they pull it off beautifully I think uh, and and you have this Another thing about this record that I like that I could also see turning people off and is something that I think Jake spoke about in his notes on this record as well, is there's a sense of kind of unresolved tension in this record as well, like within mm. the first track and within the closing track as well, both of which have this kind of building structure to them that never fully explodes the way you expect it to. There is this night kind of feeling of, of edgy tension in this record that obviously I would assume is intentional and probably reflects the tense state of the emotional place that the songwriters are in, whether it be their marriage, whether it be the cultural, social world around them, the sense of confusion and, and unresolved uh, tension is, is really prevalent across the record. And the reason why it doesn't deflate it for me is that as Sersha said, this whole thing feels so of a piece. These songs run together in a way where it feels like a suite of music such that mm, you're always, yeah. uh, you're always, I think, kept interested by the ways in which they're exploring new musical ideas without just completely um, changing direction in a way that feels unnatural. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 
Uh, on a similar enough note, I also wanted to highlight the the shorter song more on here, which I really enjoyed as this like consistent high energy point that really did do a great job at continuing this flow of tension, as you mentioned, throughout it, which is also subsequently an aspect I found myself taken with by the record that, and I think was really reflective uh, to be a broken record in those harsher moments, which I found myself really liking that, that unresolved angst and tension, which feels just so it, it feels so generally directed at the at the world around them and i i did really like that that just sense of chaos and just discomfort kind of very yeah reflective of this modern age kind of idea without without going into the typical like cliche of this being some like fucking quarantine album like this is something i can see emerging naturally as a response to the world without COVID or whatever mm. yeah it's very thematically of a piece with their last album as well double negative like the songs mm. and the ideas are essentially the same it's just the musical m- mode of exploration is different uh and and more aggressive here Yes, um, one thing I want to comment on very quickly is I think the reason the female vocals on this record strike such a chord is that the rest of the music is so low in the mix. Um, so the high cut is so cut off, and the lows are so low. And the male vocalist is very much like a tenor in his vocal range. Mm-hmm. And when she comes in, it just adds another chapter of the musical spectrum that you um sort of aren't expecting based on the level of the mix the rest of the music sits in and i i they use it to great effect especially building harmonies it's really especially with how compressed this album is in a good way as opposed to the casey musgraves record um <laughs> the mix is so tight and compact that when that like higher up female vocal comes in it's almost like um sonorous you know um, and they make great use of that. Um, like I remember how much I bitched and moaned about the compression on um, the armed record with, that we talked about, but here it feels like exactly what I wanted that effect to do on this record in terms of like just channeling the intensity that comes with a very compressed mix. Mm. Um, I talked about the second and third MGMT records as well did this really well. I would say. Mm. Yeah, I think the armed record is probably a good comp for production style from in terms of of an album this year yeah i i i think that you have to really be in touch with and i obviously really 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 like the armed record but i will say that you have to be in touch with the impact and atmosphere you're trying to convey and really making sure that the the style of production and mixing is accentuating that and not kind of bogging the listener down and again it comes back to this record being mostly comprised of pretty simple elements and having this really flowing sweet light structure that means you never really get lost in it in a bad way you just kind of get pulled up into its tapestry and pulled along and then it ends in quite a an aggressive but almost kind of cathartic place with the final track on the record as well I think and so yeah it does i don't love this as much as 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 double negative but i think that this is a really smart way to develop this aspect of their sound and it has enough despite the fact that it's getting compared to that record a lot it does enough to distinguish itself musically in terms of having its own identity and i can see why people are really responding it because it's also one of the most immediate albums that low have made in a long time as well you have to go back to the early stuff to get music that has this level of emotional immediacy uh it's not as hopeless and dour and dark as their early music is but it does a good job of of feeling quite like feeling quite emotional at certain moments on this record as well like don't walk away especially like that song i find to be really you know it just quite sad and beautiful and um yeah i I just really been really enjoying this record a lot it's, it's worth saying that the first time I heard about this record, it was in a stereo gum headline that called it post gospel. 
um, <laughs> which I think is really fucking interesting after hearing the rest of the record. It has that exultant vibe um, of gospel music but in a really different way. It's also like the ways in which Ellen and Mimi use their voices as well. And that's always been a th- the kind of core part of their music is their voices. And uh, obviously, I mean, not obviously, but they are like sort of deeply religious and their sort of faith is not a prominent part of the music, but they, they do utilize certain aspects of, of kind of like spiritual music too. And, and what's great about them and what I love about them is they'll take little bits and pieces of, of musical styles like that, but they'll always try and execute them in a really subversive way that feels like it's, it's doing that thing in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, but yeah, that's just me getting into the weeds a little bit there, but, <laughs> but uh, I think that's kind of what is meant with that sort of post-gospel thing, although it's not a term I would use, but I can see where it comes from. Okay. Favorite tracks and ratings for Lowe's. Hey, what? What? Uh, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, we'll do reverse order this time. My three favorite tracks on this record are Hey, Days Like These, and All Night. Uh, least favorite track is There's a Comma After Still. Uh, and I give the record an eight. Amazing. Um, so I want to highlight Hey as well. Um, I also want to highlight uh the, the closer the price you pay you must be wearing off and i want to highlight uh oh, there's so many good tracks um let's say all night because i did really like that um do i have a least favorite no maybe i can wait but it's still really good i'll give it an 8.5 out of 10 all righty my favorite tracks are the price you pay parentheses and must be wearing off <laughs> uh don't walk away and days like these uh least favorite i don't remember all night doing very much for me um and i will give this a seven out of ten that's my my three favorite tracks from this album here you see are uh white horses uh days like these and more my least favorite track on this album would be uh hey and I would give it a uh, five and a half out of 10. Thank you, WC Fields. All right, Jake's ratings <laughs> and favorite tricks are... Transported back to the year 1945, which is convenient. Let's give a big... Next... Yeah, let's give, give a, a big welcome shout. to our next guest, Upton Sinclair. He's here to review the new record. Give a oh, big so shout awesome. out to Christina Applegate. All right, um, <laughs> Jake's... <laughs> what? What? Real ones, no. Jake's. Uh, I guess J- I'm a fake one. J- Jake's favorite tracks are "All Night," "Disappearing," and more. His least favorite is "White Horses," and Jake gives the record a six point five. Oh, cool. Um, so that's an average overall of seven point one, which is equivalent to uh, "See Turtle Cowboy" by Against Me, "Forgotten Days" by Paul Bearer. Drunk Tank Pink by Shame, Peaceful as Hell by Black Dresses, and Divorced Trauma Anime by Open Mike Eagle. Second year episode ruined my marriage. Shit, shoot a gun with a goddamn warning. So that concludes the 61st episode of Jams and T podcast and the final main episode featuring Sersha. But if you are keen, which you should be if you're here, then you can stick around for the subsequent videos coming out this week, which will be on Sersha's final record club recommendation, which is Neutral Milk Hotels in the Aeroplane Over the Sea, and our 1991 retrospective this week, which covers Nirvana's Nevermind. So do, you do not want to miss either of those. Let us know in the comments below what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today. Do you think we were too harsh on Casey? I'd love to see you make a case for Starcrossed. And what did you think of the low record? We want to hear from you in the comments below. So hit us up. Make sure you like and subscribe if you have not done that already. It really does help us, especially as a smaller scale channel. And all that remains, of course, as you all know, is to let August take us home. As always, everyone. Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Chuck E. Cheese, where a kid can be a kid. <laughs>